Chairman Watley, thank you so much for doing this. You just had a major weekend here in Palm Beach. You had your biggest donors. You had the stars of the Republican Party all gathering here, just as we're about six months out from the election. What is the message that you wanted people to walk away with from this weekend? I, I think momentum and I think unity. Those are really the two things that mm. we're seeing right now is that uh, the Republican Party is absolutely coming together behind Donald Trump and, and supporting uh, this candidate right now. And, and we feel really solid about what we're seeing on every front, whether it's, it's the rallies across the country, it's the impromptu events that the president is making, whether it's at a Chick-fil-A in Vine City, Georgia, or walking around the corner from you know, to a bodega uh, up in New York, um, or even the, the major events that we're seeing. But he is getting a fantastic response, and we're really seeing every aspect of the Republican Party coalescing behind him. And we're also seeing polls uh, from every battleground state, national polls, issue polls, that show him with a very real lead uh, across the country. And, and so we see that momentum and we're feeling it. And the RNC, I mean, the overhaul has been done. You have remade the organization just as things are kicking into high gear here. Can you talk to me about what are sort of those fundamental differences now in this new version of the RNC that you think will bring about more success? Well, the fundamental thing is that we have a nominee now, right? And so the RNC, prior to having Donald Trump getting the electors that, that he needs to be the formal nominee, uh, we, were, we were tasked with being neutral. We were tasked with kind of navigating through the primary process. Uh, we now have a presumptive nominee, and so we have reoriented ourselves uh, to incorporate uh, the president, his team, and his message into the RNC operations and make sure that we're unified as we go out onto the campaign trail. I'm sure you know that RNC has been accused of creating a sort of litmus test for employees or potential hires around denying the results of the 2024 election. Is there any truth to that? The, the only litmus test that I have is whether or not you support our Republican candidates and whether you're willing to work 24-7 from now through November 5th to make sure that we win. The former president, though, did tell Time magazine recently that he, quote, wouldn't feel good about it if anyone was hired to his campaign or the RNC that doesn't believe the election was stolen. Why would you hire someone that the former president wouldn't feel good about. Look, what, what, what I want to hire are people who are going to work 24-7 to help elect this president and people who support him and who support his agenda. We've seen in both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, there are some challenges when it comes to unity. I mean, the Biden campaign is dealing with hundreds of thousands of folks voting uncommitted. You guys, on the other hand, and, and the former president, Nikki Haley, who's been out of the race for months now, is getting 15 to 20 percent of the vote in battleground states and in key counties. Do you see the RNC's job as bringing those people home? And how are you going to do it? Yeah, it's part of our job. Right. I mean, and what we need to make sure is that every Republican is going to support the president. And then we need to persuade the, the independents, the unaffiliated voters uh, to to come across and, and vote our way as well. That's the two parts to any big campaign. So, yeah. Um, and, and we're seeing it. We're feeling it right now that the base is absolutely with the president. Uh, we've seen recent polling that shows over 90 percent of all Republicans support President Trump, support the job that he did when he was the president, as opposed to a much, much lower percentage for Joe Biden. But are you trying to specifically target those Haley voters? I mean, the Biden campaign just launched a six figure ad buy to try to win over those Haley voters in Pennsylvania. Are we going to see anything like that from you guys? Look, our message is a message that resonates with every American family. You know, you think about families vote. Families vote together. They talk about political issues. What do they care about? They care about jobs. They care about the economy. They care about education. They care about safety. They care about security. These are issue sets that apply, whether it's rural families, urban families, suburban families, whether they're black families or they're Hispanic families or Asian American families. It is, it is the same set of issues that everybody is going to be focused on. And Donald Trump has a four-year track record of success, and Joe Biden has a four-year track record of failure. That is our message to all of the American voters. But those voters, it seemed, were trying to send a message, especially by voting for someone that was out of the race. So are you saying it's more about sort of messaging in Trump himself versus like anything tactical that you guys are trying to do? Look, what, what we're trying to do is we are now in general election mode. And, and the president has, has cleared this primary 
earlier than any other Republican in a contested primary ever, yeah. which gives us a lot more time going into the convention to make sure that we're bringing everybody together. But we are in general election mode. This is going to be Donald Trump versus Joe Biden. And the contrast has never been bigger between two candidates. And so we're going to start drawing that contrast today. I would think that every Republican voter is going to understand that the world is going to be in a better place, that America is going to be in a better place with President Trump as opposed to Joe Biden. You do have some discord on the Hill right now. When you talk about unity, you've got Speaker Johnson, who's under threat of a motion to vacate from Marjorie Taylor Greene and some uh, a faction of, of Republicans in the House. What is your message to that small faction that's trying to take his job? Look, we see three big functions right now going into this election cycle. We have got to elect Donald Trump as president. We need to flip the Senate and we need to expand our majority in the House. We're not going to do that if we're not unified. We need to make sure that all of the Republicans understand the gravity of this election cycle, and they do, and we need to make sure that we are on the same page as we're moving forward. I know your one of your favorite topics is election integrity. You guys recently announced a 100,000 person strong election integrity program. What exactly is that going to look like and how is it going to be different than what you had, say, in, in 2020? Sure. So I, I think when you look at election integrity, you really need to look at two primary functions, right? So number one is we want to make sure that the laws and the rules and the regulations in every state are conducive to a fair, accurate, secure and transparent election. So we have things that we're going to be voting for, like voter ID, making sure that only American citizens can vote, making sure that uh, we have protections in place for mail-in ballots. These are things that are supported by 80 percent of the voters all across the country. The second thing that we want to do is we want to be in the room when votes are being cast and when they're being counted. So we are recruiting and training thousands of volunteers uh, to make sure that, that we're going to have poll judges, poll workers, and poll observers in place uh, when when voting is taking place. Do you place. feel that wasn't the case in 2020? I, I think that we are building it out systematically into every single state. Uh, we have seen different states come at this with varying degrees of success, uh, but it's really critical for us, we feel, to make sure that we have the buy-in from all Republicans to understand that election integrity is a critical component of what we're doing. What do you say to critics who are concerned about voter intimidation? Look, I, I, I go back to the Georgia election integrity law that everybody said was going to be catastrophic. In the next election cycle, they had record amount of turnout. They had record number of voters that, that showed up for it. This is, this is a system designed to make it easy to vote and hard to cheat. You've got a bank your vote campaign. I know uh, we've been talking to GOP chairs in various battlegrounds that are really trying to get folks to mail in their votes, to vote early, you know, using all the tools in the toolbox. The former president, though, has continuously talked about how he doesn't trust mail-in voting. He thinks it's a form of cheating. And voters, from what we've seen on the ground, seem to have sort of heard that message and taken it to heart. Do you think it's too late to turn that around? No, I don't think. Look, over 50 percent of all the votes are going to be cast before Election Day this November. And that includes Republicans, it includes independents, and it includes Democrats. So people are voting early. People are voting by mail. We as a Republican Party need to talk to them before they vote. We want to make sure that every voter is an informed voter. So we're moving all of our communications apparatus earlier. We mm -hmm. want to make sure that we're getting the messaging out. We're knocking on doors earlier. We're making phone calls earlier so that when those people go to vote, they're going to be informed voters. President Trump was very clear in a, in a uh, truth that he posted uh, just a couple weeks ago where he said, Early voting is great. Mail-in voting is great. But he did that after many, many, many months, years, really, of talking about how mail-in The president has been very consistent in saying that he would like, ultimately, to get back to same-day voting, but that's not where we are today. And we need to win with the rules that we have in place. And so we are working right now with every state party to understand what are the rules that are in place in that state and communicate with the voters. So if a voter wants to vote by mail, great, here's how you do it. If a voter wants to vote early, great, here's how you do it. If you want to vote on Election Day, great, here's how you do it. We want to get that information out to the voters. We want them to make a plan 
and then we want to stick to that plan and get that vote in. And I did see that that true social post from the former president. Do you, so do you feel like you guys have gotten him to sort of come around? Is that going to stick? Yeah, look, I think that he is, he is, again, very consistent in saying that ultimately, you know, he would like to see some changes nationally uh, in a state-by-state -state basis, but we are going to win by the rules of the road that we have in place today, and we need to compete. As part of the election integrity program, I know you guys said that the RNC is engaged in 82 election integrity lawsuits in 25 states. What do you say to critics who argue that these lawsuits are just sort of paving the way for former President Trump to claim the election was stolen in 2024 if, if President Biden wins? They're, they're absolutely not. Look, we're, we're trying to do through these lawsuits is get states to implement common sense election integrity programs, like making sure that we have common sense protections on mail-in voting, making sure that only citizens can vote, making sure that the states are cleaning up the voter rolls. These are things that are strongly supported by a vast majority of the American people uh, that has nothing to do with voter suppression. Let's talk about some headway that we've seen in the polls that you guys are making, the Republican Party is making, with sort of new demographics to come into the fold, come into the tent. You've got young voters, but especially minority voters. And I know the former president is really focused on uh, the black vote because you've seen some gains there. Um, what are you doing to, to take advantage of the, the interest that you're seeing there? Well, the thing that, that we want to do is we want to communicate, right? So, so people talk about political issues. They talk about voting as a family. And what are the issues that affect every family? There are jobs in the economy. It's education, it's security, it's safety. These are the things that we are talking about. And Republicans are winning because we are hearing the voters. We're listening to the voters. We're putting issues on the table to address the concerns that they have. And that's why the policies are there. These issues apply whether it's, a, it, it's, it's you know, an American family in a rural town or in a, rural, a, a suburban town or an urban town. Every American family are facing these same sets of challenges. Right now, inflation is a huge issue that is affecting every family. The, the price of housing, the price of energy, the price of groceries are up 20% over the last four years. Wages are not, right? So it is harder for the American families right now to, do, to get by. So we're having those conversations into every single community. Well, so l let me ask you to elaborate a little bit on that because there's a message and you guys feel like you, you really know the message that you want to uh, convey to people, but then there's the tactics of how you actually engage those voters. Uh, there have been reports that the RNC has shuttered some of those minority outreach centers. If, if you're not using those sorts of tools, how are you getting? Well, we haven't shuttered a single one. And so we, we are actually up and there running. There are multiple. I mean, one of them has been replaced by a, a check cashing store, another an ice cream shop. That they've been shut down over the course of the last Look, the, couple of the, years. There were some that were shut down after the 22 election cycle okay. or shut down during 2023. But since we have President Biden or President Trump has come in as our presumptive nominee, we've not closed down a single one of those offices. We're using them. They're very successful in terms of our tools that, that we're working so to that get is something you'll be community. relying on. Absolutely. And, and we also are going to make sure that our voter contacts are real voter contacts. We want to have conversations with voters in order to, to have a discussion with them about the issues that they care about. It's not about how many doors you knock if you don't ever actually talk to anybody. It's not about how many times you call somebody if you don't get them on the phone. It's how many conversations do you actually have with those voters. And how, what does that look like? How are you guys actually getting into those communities and, and having those conversations? It's, it's very traditional voter contact measures, right? And, 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 and we are targeting the people that we want to go talk to, and we are sending them direct mail, and we are sending them digital messages, and we are targeting them on TV and radio, and we're having the five-minute conversations that are so important at the doors and on the phone calls. It's very traditional electioneering in terms of the tactics mm. that you use. It's, it's, it's an issue of we have a better message and we have a better candidate and we need to make sure that people are understanding the chasm between the four years under President Trump and Joe Biden on the issues that people care about. What have, what have you seen 
that is working? Why do you think you're seeing these numbers, uh, particularly with black voters and Hispanic voters? Well, I think, uh, I think inflation is obviously a huge driver, right? I think the price increases that we have seen over the last four years are very, very real. I think immigration is an absolutely huge factor. We've seen 10 million plus illegal immigrants that have come across our southern border, and that is putting a tremendous strain on every city. It is making every state a border state. We are seeing fentanyl deaths that are doubling since 2019. That, that, that is a very real issue playing itself on TV. We are seeing right now uh, the chaos that Joe Biden's weakness on the world stage has unleashed. We, we've seen Russia invade Ukraine. We have seen Iran openly attacking Israel for the first time. So, you know, that, that as a whole, I think people are looking at Joe Biden and they are seeing a picture of weakness and they don't want America to be in a weak position. Do you have someone in charge of minority outreach? Have you guys established any specific programs you can tell me about? We have. It's, it's called our Strategic Initiative Office, and mm -hmm. we'll have to, to set you up with, with somebody to have a more in-depth, deep That'd conversation on that. Excellent. Um, let's talk about the issue that Republicans have been struggling with. It's abortion. Uh, President Biden in, uh, won in 2020 in large part because of suburban women. In 2022, a lot of the, the red wave that didn't happen, people credit to the abortion issue. Given that it's going to play such a big role in the election, it, is the RNC, is the Republican Party going to come out with their abortion platform? Well, look, I think that, that the party overall is going to maintain a platform discussion that is going to be about life. It's going to be about the life of the mother. It's going to be about the life of babies and a culture of life that, that we support from the moment of birth until uh, death, right? But when, when we talk about this conversation, very important to note that, that Republicans and conservatives have fought for 50 years to overturn Roe v. Wade. To, to defederalize the issue of abortion and return it back to the states. President Trump has said that he strongly supports that move and wants this discussion to take place with the voters in the states. We agree. This is something that is going to take place on a state-by-state -state basis, and every candidate is going to have to have a conversation with their voters about the issue. Let's talk about third party, RFK. Are you worried? Look, I, I think it totally depends on how RFK Jr. is going to be positioned. If, if folks are only going to hear him talk about vaccines, then that may affect their votes in one way. But if they look at his liberal record, which is far more liberal than even Joe Biden's over the years, then they're going to look at him in an entirely different direction. So, you know, we obviously want to make sure that this is a head-on-head -head conversation because of the, 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 the direct comparison that we have between the four years of President Trump versus the four years of Joe Biden. Yeah. But he is going to be a factor in this election cycle. I think that, that overall, uh, it is going to be terribly important for the voters who are considering him to understand that this is a very far left candidate uh, who is actually going to pull more votes from Joe Biden than he is from President Trump. You know, of course, you're dealing with a former president having to sit in a court four days a week. At the same time, him being in court does rally the base. Is it more harmful because you don't get as much of his time, or is it more helpful that he is in the middle of all of this right I, now? I think it's different, right? I mean, we, we with him in court for four days a week, it, it, it basically allows us Wednesdays and Saturdays to be able to move him around the country and to try and do events. But at the same time, he has the ability at 6.30 in the morning to go out and meet with construction workers in New York while Joe Biden is still in bed and drive an entire news cycle for 48 hours. He has the ability to walk out of court around the corner to a bodega and have a conversation and, the, and drive the media cycle for another 24 to 48 hours. He can have an impromptu press conference at the courthouse and every camera is going to be on him. So this is a guy who absolutely can communicate directly with the American voters that, that we've never really seen before. And obviously, when he is on the road, when he's doing rallies or he's out doing other events, we need to make sure that we maximize the time uh, and the impact that he can have as he's moving around the country. You guys uh, are looking to expand your map. We just reported at NBC that you're looking at uh, Minnesota and Virginia. Why are you eyeing those states? 
Look, every decision that we make as a campaign is going to be driven by data. It's going to be driven by polling. It's going to be driven by what we are seeing on the ground with metrics. And right? you see inroads and, there. And we do. We absolutely see inroads in those states. We feel, you know, that there are the, the traditional battleground states that everybody's kind of paying attention to. But we're seeing in these states a real move towards President Trump. Uh, we're seeing him within the margin. Uh, in these states and think it's terribly important when we see those shifts to be able to recalibrate the campaign accordingly. The Democrats, on the other hand, are eyeing North Carolina, a state you know a little something about. Do you think they might have a chance there? Is that something you're concerned about? Well, I, I think you're always concerned, right? So North Carolina is a true purple state. It is 30 percent Republican, 33 percent Democrat, 37 percent unaffiliated. So it's always going to be a very competitive state. But President Trump won it in 2020. He won it in 2016. Uh, we fully expect that he's going to win it in 24. Uh, and we feel very good about the, the team that we have on the ground down there and the conversations that are taking place with voters every day. The Biden campaign has touted they have a lot of offices set up all across these battleground states. Uh, people are asking, where is the Trump presence? What's going on with your ground game? What can you tell me about how you guys are, are working to, to, to beef up that operation? And do you need to do this a little bit differently because you have a candidate that's so non-traditional? So are you approaching this in a different way? Yeah, look, what we're trying to do is have conversations directly with voters. And that, that really, truly is what it comes down to. When we can have those conversations with the voters, we'll see it. We got record numbers in the Iowa primary. We got record numbers in New Hampshire and in South Carolina and in Nevada. So every state that, that this campaign has gone into, uh, we're seeing record numbers because of the approach that but we're taking. But are you taking. there yet? Are you in Pennsylvania? Are you in Michigan? Absolutely. Are you in Georgia? We are. And, and, and we are initiating those conversations right now with voters, and we are building out the infrastructure that we need every day. Why do you think it's not as visible as, as the Biden campaign? Is it, are we not reporting on it enough? Are you, like, what, what's, what's going on? Well, I think if you, if you just say that, that there are brick-and-mortar shops that they are paying rent for. Mm -hmm. Are they going to be paying more uh, for, for more facilities like that than we are? Maybe, right? The, the key for us is, is that we want to talk to voters, and we want to measure the conversations that we're having voters. That's what's going to be the key. And, and I think that when you pressure tech that against what happened in the primaries, you're going to see we had great results with this type of an approach, and we feel very comfortable with it. We're going to talk to voters. You're going to see President Trump on TV. You're going to see digital con uh, advertising. You're going to see phone calls. You're going to see door knocks. All of the traditional voter outreach tools we're absolutely going to be using. But again, you know, you don't need right now. The, the President Biden has spent $30 million in advertising and gone down in the polls. President Trump has not spent a dollar on TV advertising and he's gone up in the polls. So we're seeing right now is a national conversation it's about strength versus weakness. It's about success versus failure. And, and these are things that are in the president's sight. These are things that the president is very strong on. All right, sir. Anything else you want to add? We're excited about this election cycle. I think we have an absolutely fantastic opportunity to elect President Trump, to flip the Senate, and to expand our majority in the House. All right. Chairman, I appreciate your time. Thank Excellent. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Yes, ma'am. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.